I mean, I was Drake's muse when he wrote Finesse. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome back to my channel if you're new here. My name is Lamia. Today it's a bit of a story time. I have been meaning to tell this story for so long now and I always said I'd tell it one day and today is the day. So as the title suggests, today I will be talking about how I studied at the 8th best university in the world, aka the University College London, better known as UCL, um, for free, but it still came at a great expense. So I have split this story into seven parts for the sake of this video and it's probably going to be a bit longer. I will try to put some timestamps so if you want to hop around you can, but I will say that I am telling the story chronologically. Part one, the backstory. So the backstory is that I was doing my bachelor's degree in Venice in Italy at the time and my second year was just very miserable. I was deeply unhappy and it got to a point where I basically got to a crossroads where it was like I'm either going to drop out because I'm that unhappy or I'm going to leave Italy somehow and just not have to be here ever again. You know I may detail what was what exactly was causing my unhappiness in Italy maybe soon i don't know i'm not i'm a bit undecided on whether i want to share that yet basically you know in a nutshell the push factors were overt racism discrimination and academic dissatisfaction sometimes an amalgamation of all of those things so you may find yourself throughout the story thinking to yourself like why didn't you just give up like the odds were clearly against you the answer is probably that I just needed to leave Italy and there were a lot of things I was going to do but one thing I was not going to do was stay another year in Italy. It wasn't going to happen. I also want to say like, you know, if you know me personally or if you, you know, know me from this channel, like I'm deeply passionate about education. Um, I mean, I, I made a whole YouTube channel about education. So yeah, I think, you know, wanting to drop out shows you just how unhappy I really was. So basically, you know, in studying abroad, I didn't want to hop out of the frying pan into the fire. I really wanted to be in an English speaking environment. I wanted to be in a place that was more diverse where seeing somebody like me wasn't all that much of a shock to the system. You know what I mean? I eventually narrowed down to the UK because it honestly just made sense. I wanted to go somewhere with a very reputable education system because I really wanted um, to be challenged academically. I had never been to the UK prior, but every time I would meet British people, like we could bond over our very similar childhoods, you know, growing up on the same books, the same media, um, growing up on CBBS and stuff. So I kind of figured that I was culturally British and, you know, in moving to the UK it wouldn't be so much of a shock. I mean, they do call London Harare North for a reason. Also, the other reason was that um, my thesis actually focused on like decolonization in the British Empire and like Zim Zimbabwe, UK diplomatic relations. So it just made sense for me to be in the UK. When I started doing my research for the exchange program, I was under the impression that my degree program, which was philosophy, international studies and economics, fell under the Department of Humanities. Right, you get my, you get my drift, right? Apparently it didn't. Uh, it actually fell under the Department of Cultural Heritage or something like that. But actually this misunderstanding ended up being a lifesaver. So I am in the habit of being very honest with myself, especially when it comes to something that I really want. I assessed you know, my chances. The people in my degree program were exceptionally smart. I mean, the program itself was quite selective. When I actually got to first year and I heard you know, about the actual process that the Italian students had to go through just to be admitted into this program, I was like, wow, it's selective. If I'm not mistaken, it was actually even a bit more expensive. All that to say, the kids were smart, they were on top of their game and they had high GPAs. I was honest with myself, I was like, the reality is the majority of these kids, <laughs> I say these kids, they were like my age mates. The fact of the matter is that most of, um, I'll just go with these kids, most of these kids have very high GPAs that could you know, be the same as my GPA or they could be higher. And I was like, I'm just not going to leave my fate and ultimately my happiness, my sanity and my peace of mind in the hands of an institution which has already shown me that beyond the diversity numbers, international students aren't all that much of a concern to them. So I was like, respectfully, I'm not competing. And so I hopped to the Department of Humanities and I'd obviously done my research. I realized I could do that. And I was a lot happier there, especially after I realized that they had not one, but two partnerships with the University College London. And I almost couldn't believe it. It was like finding gold and nobody else knows about it. So I looked at like the results from like the previous two to three years. And I actually noticed that much to my surprise, um, 
The spots for UCL weren't always that full. For my top UCL choice, there were three spots every year. And there were years where there'd only be one candidate selected or two. And sometimes, you know, all three of them. I basically realized that unlike my department, the Department of Humanities was less competitive. I think it's because a lot of the courses taught under the Department of Humanities, like philosophy and history, were actually taught in Italian. So these were probably students who didn't speak English at all, or maybe if they did, they didn't speak that much. So they obviously had no intentions of going to the UK where everything would be entirely in English. That was the best explanation I could come up with part two. Setting myself up for success. I always say that I'm really ever the smartest person in the room and unfortunately, really am I ever the funniest person in the room. But the most strategic, I think I have a good shot at that one. So essentially, I really became involved in my student societies. I was already, you know, really involved from my first year, but I really doubled down. If there was like an event to do with the Venice Diplomatic Society, I was probably going to be there. At the same time, I was um, employed by the university as like a student ambassador, where I was doing a lot of like speaking and writing engagements. And of course, the most important aspect of all of this was honestly, my academics. So the cool thing about my degree was that you didn't necessarily have to follow the course like linearly. So if you were in your first year, but you wanted to take a course like international law, which otherwise would be taught in your third year, you could actually just take it. I didn't go according to my interests. I went according to credit weighting. So I essentially just went for all the 30 credit courses and I made sure that I got those exams done. And on top of that, obviously I made sure that I was studying really hard so that my grades and my GPA were as high as they could be. So that essentially when it came down to, I had enough credits to prove myself and I had you know, a GPA to also support my academic abilities. And then of course, when it came to my actual motivation letter, I went all in, like I was not modest at all. I was pretty much like, you know I'm that girl, right? And also I was like, I need to be at UCL. Like I need to be there. Like this thesis will not be the same without this component. And um, of course, it's always very helpful when your motivation letter can be backed up by everything that you've done. And that leads me into part three, acceptances and rejections. So the way the Erasmus system works, so essentially there's two steps to the process. You first apply through your university, they accept you, i.e. they nominate you, to then put in an application to the host institution. I was accepted and basically nominated by my university to pursue my final year at uh, UCL and it was just a very happy moment for me. At the time I remember I was actually in Geneva when I got the results and I was obviously very excited because I had dedicated pretty much a whole year to making sure that this would happen but at the same time it was like this was just the beginning because I knew that my actual application to UCL itself would be the hard part. So eventually I met my Erasmus coordinator, i.e. the person who actually nominated me. And uh, this is a story for another day, but he was a very interesting person. It helped that, you know, being a history professor, he was quite interested in my background. So every time I'd go and see him, he would take the opportunity to ask me about my life. But it was really funny because all he would do was just roast me and roast the UK. He was not a fan of the Brits at all. And I remember the one time I had asked him to like sign a document and he was like, I'm going to support you, but I'll never understand why you want to go to the UK during Brexit. Speaking of Brexit, okay segue, Brexit now became my issue too, because the Erasmus program is essentially a European Union affair. So there was a lot of speculation about whether the UK would continue to be part of the Erasmus program for the upcoming academic year, as in the academic year I was planning to be in the UK. So, you know, if Theresa May was behind the podium, I was there. So lucky for me and a lot of other people, um, we eventually received word that the Erasmus program would continue for another year. Don't quote me on this, but I actually think that I was part of the last cohort of Erasmus students going to the UK and UK kids going to anywhere else in Europe. As much as, you know, the cessation of the Erasmus program to the UK, you know, affected people that wanted to go and study in the UK. It equally affected British nationals. I'm thinking of British nationals who study things like modern languages, who really benefit from like that year in Spain or that year in France or that year in Italy. Very disappointing. So yes, essentially I got stuck into the, the hard part of the application, which was putting my application into UCL directly. So I chose to do a course called European Social and Political Studies or ESPS as it's better known because it was the closest course at UCL to my degree. 
So I put in my application, really, you know, went in on my personal statement, watched all the videos, really put together a solid personal statement that was read by all of like my 10 friends and they, you know, critiqued it and stuff. In the end, it was an application I was really proud of. And of course, the waiting game is never fun. And so I was just waiting for this email. And then the one day the email arrived and I was in class at the time. I kid you not, you guys, I looked down and the email notification pops up on my phone and the first word I see is unfortunately to say that I had heart palpitations would simply be hmm, an understatement like I was not okay so I literally just got up so abruptly and I left and I went to the back of the classroom where I finally got the courage to open up this email basically the email said you know what unfortunately you can't study ESPS because UCL and your university are only partnered for history, archaeology and linguistics. So they basically gave me an ultimatum. Your first option is we can disregard your application or you can choose to study one of these um, disciplines. To which I replied, do you know what? Like I adore history. I don't know a better study discipline. Like hist have you ever stopped to ask yourself without having a look at history? What really are we, you know? Like if we don't consider history, I was just like, you know what, it's fine. Um, I'm not staying in Italy, so respectfully, I am now a historian. So I literally got back to them very quickly and I was like, you know what, I'll study history. Um, and obviously I asked them, do you need me to do like another application? Because I was just thinking about my personal statement where I was literally talking about how passionate I am about European social and political studies. They actually ended up saying, no, don't worry to do another application. If we need you to do another personal statement, we will um, we'll contact you. So that was how everything was going externally. Internally, not gonna lie and not gonna cap, I was very stressed because my previous experience with history at A-level was not a positive one. And so I was actually very stressed and I was like, contacting my friend, we'll call him Ronald. So I was contacting Ron and Ron is British and he was actually studying history in the UK. And so I was just asking him all these questions like, bro, why do you study history? What motivates one to study history? Like, tell me all the things, am I gonna be okay? You know, like with my academic background and like international studies, could I essentially make this jump? And he was obviously very chill and so nice about it. And he was like, you're gonna be fine. Like a lot of the history in the UK actually is very political leaning anyway. So that really calmed me down. He provided me with like a lot of resources and it was just really cool. Shout out to you, Ron, if you're watching this. So eventually I was contacted by the administration and they said, actually, we need you to do another application for history. And at this point I was very prepared. In fact, I'd actually already started doing a personal statement tailored to history. So I submitted my application, changed my tune because obviously I went from, I'm so passionate about ESPS to history is just the best study discipline in the world. And then of course the waiting period began again and I, quite literally felt sick to my stomach and every day I would just be refreshing my emails and it was just very stressful because I'll remind you yes I so badly wanted to go to UCL and I wanted the experience but more than anything else I just could not stay another year in Italy so eventually the one morning I woke up to an email which had been sent from the UCL um, system at like five in the morning and it was just one of the happiest days of my life and I just felt so much relief um, but little did I know the struggle was not yet over, leading me into part four, the discrepancy. The following is really not an attack on UCL because the ugly truth is that this would have happened to me at any other institution. But basically I received a conditional offer on the basis that they needed me to prove my English proficiency. And so I genuinely, like really in my heart of hearts, I really thought this was just a, like a slight um, error or misunderstanding on their part in the application when I was asked, is English your first language? I had obviously said yes. Um, and I thought maybe they missed that. So I'd actually reached out to them and said, oh, I think there's a bit of an error. Um, I noticed that I need to prove my English proficiency, but English is my first language. And basically UCL wrote back and they were like, no, there wasn't an error. We really do need you to prove your English proficiency. And I was like, but why? It's my first language. Anyway, they were like, Zimbabwe does not feature on the list of these countries, I'm paraphrasing, but it was like the list of countries where English is spoken by the majority of the country or something along those lines. And I had a look at this list and 
I don't think a list has ever infuriated me more. It's crazy that I'm finding myself in this situation, but surely, you know, there's something, there's another way that I can prove that English is really my first language. So obviously I looked around the website and then I found a section where it basically said, if you did English at like O level, we'll accept a B. So I was like, okay, I'll be fine because, you know, firstly, not only did I do English language and literature at O level, I also did it at A level. And also at O level, I didn't get a B, I got an A star. So I was like, okay, I'm giving them a lot more than they've asked for. I should be fine, right? Right? Anyway, um, ridiculous as it is to me, I submit these um, certificates of mine where it clearly says, like literally, I can't make this up, on my O-level certificate, it, li it literally says first language English. This is the part where I so badly want to tell you I'm lying, but I'm really not. UCL hits me up and they're on some, you took this exam over five years ago. So your results have basically expired. When I tell you guys I was confused, I was like, did I wake up one morning and just forget how to speak my native language? Like, I was so upset and yeah, that's basically where they gave me an ultimatum and they were like, it's either you, you know, do an IELTS test or you don't come to UCL. Again, I was very desperate to leave Italy. So I was like, okay, next thing I knew I was on the IELTS website. As you can imagine, the test was actually very expensive. It was off the top of my memory. I think it was around like 265 US dollars. And I remember when I showed up for um, the written test, the hall was so full. And I remember all the conversations that I overheard were people just, you know, stating how ridiculous it was that we were expected to take this test. Time was really of the essence, so I gave UCL everything that they had asked for, but there was a section of my results certificate which really confused me. So it was actually the speaking component of the test. It was genuinely just a conversation. And I remember like, you know, the examiner even giggled at a few of my witty responses and stuff. So the highest grade you can get for each component is, nine, is, is a 9.0. Anyway, tell me why for my speaking I was given an 8.5. Again, don't quote me, this was so long ago, but I think I actually went to go read what an 8.5 kind of correlates to. And it, it said something to the effect of like, they have a good understanding of the language, but there were some questions that kind of like threw them off. Not only is this test very expensive, I'm also questioning the validity of it. And also, as if that wasn't enough, in very fine print at the bottom of your certificate, it actually says these results expire in two years. I'm not saying it's a scam, but um, I am saying that I think they really do prioritize profits. That's what I will say. Part five, and probably the reason you clicked on this video, securing the bag. So the way the Erasmus system is set up, you actually don't pay tuition fees to the university you're going to, i.e. your host university. You just continue paying your tuition fees to your home university. My tuition fees at my own university in Italy were really affordable, especially when compared against, you know, my initial idea of tuition fees, you know, being those of private like boarding schools in Zimbabwe. I remember in my first year when my mom and I had seen the the figure of my tuition fee. We actually thought it was a scam. My mom was like, this has scam written all over it. Like Lamia, human trafficking is real. And then I remember in my second year of university, that figure was like slashed in half. And that was very confusing. And I reached out to the administration to ask what was going on. And then they told me that my grades were decent. So they just gave me like an automatic academic scholarship. So I was like, okay, cool, thanks, I'll take it. So in moving to London, my main um, concern was definitely the cost of rent. I mean, we all know London is definitely not a cheap city. I really wanted to live in the student accommodation like right on campus. I wanted the full experience. When you're selected for an Erasmus exchange you also receive a grant again from the EU and there are tiers. In tier one it is the list of countries basically that have like a higher cost of living so like the UK was there um, amongst all of like the Scandinavian countries and Again, don't quote me, but I think it was something like 350 euros a month um, for 10 months, which was obviously, it was obviously very helpful and I was really grateful, especially being a third country national, i.e. somebody who is not from a member state of the EU, to be benefiting from an EU project, like so cool. I just loved to see it, it was really cool. But of course, realistically, this would not really scratch the surface in a city like London. So I needed additional funding. And that's when I came to find out about like um, this, what do I call it? Like a financial aid scheme in Venice um, called EASE, that's I -S -S -E, S-E. And my Nigerian classmate had continuously, like throughout my years at university, had continuously been telling me like, 
you should just apply for like an easier financial aid. And at the time I was like, you know, my tuition fees are really next to nothing. Like it's fine. I really would rather pay these tuition fees than to go through all this paperwork and stuff. But the time came for me to really do it. And it was, if you know anything about Italian bureaucracy, then you probably have some insight into just how tedious this entire process was and obviously I felt really bad having to ask my mom to do some running around to get me these documents and get it signed at the Italian embassy in Zimbabwe and all of these things but the one silver lining out of all of this was that my mom you know was really frustrated with this whole process because she got like a tiny sliver of insight into just everything I had been going through in the past two years and prior to that I think she really thought I was just being a snowflake so it was quite nice for her to kind of get a little glimpse into what I had been experiencing for the past two years and to see that I really wasn't exaggerating. It really was that bad. I had a friend, we'll call her Eve, and Eve was also going to do an Erasmus in the UK. And so she suggested that we go to our EASE appointment together. So we did. And um, I don't know why I was like this, but I used to try and like shelter my friends from seeing the dark side of my experience as a person of color in Venice in having our appointment together I think this was a moment where Eve really noticed the differences in the way we were treated I remember sitting at this appointment and um, I think I was the first ever Zimbabwean to be in the system so she didn't know the word for a Zimbabwean woman in Italian and I was telling her it's Zimbabweze because of course I'd been taking Italian classes where I needed to know how to how to say I'm Zimbabwean and she just refused to believe me until her boss was like, what's going on over there? And then um, she explained the situation to her boss and her boss was like looking it up and her boss was like, oh, it's Zimbabwe. I was like, and a few weeks later, I found out that I did qualify for financial aid, which was really so helpful. And again, don't quote me, but I think it was something like um, 450 euros every month. So of course the 450 euros from EASE and the 350 euros Erasmus grant helped me to secure the accommodation I really wanted. And yeah, it just helped me to live my best life in London. And I did just that. And of course, when the time came to pay my tuition fees, I had all of my um, EASE documents together. So I just decided to apply for financial aid. They basically gave me back like double what I would have paid for tuition fees. So yes, I did in fact study at the eighth best university in the world for free for 0, 0.00 Great Britain pounds sterling. Part six, tier four visa. So of course my next stress came um, in the form of acquiring a British visa, which if you don't already know, it is one of the hardest visas to obtain. And I mean, I'm not a criminal, I have a clean record, but you just never know when it comes to British visas and US visas. And of course it would be my first time applying, so I didn't really have that kind of record to be like, oh, I've been to the UK before. Of course it would also be really expensive because they actually make you pay for your health insurance at the same time as you pay your visa. So it's together. When I applied for my tier four visa, it was around like 350 pounds somewhere there again I was really tunnel vision so I'd actually been saving up for my um, British visa long before the results were even out like that's what you call delusion I mean for anybody interested I was using the good old-fashioned envelope method so yeah it still works I was expecting it to go smoothly but that's never ever the case as we've seen with this entire story when the time came for me to pay for my visa it just was not allowing me to make the payment because of my Italian bank account, it's always them. So shout out to my aunt in the UK who really assisted me with that. And then of course, another document that they needed for my visa, which I was not expecting, was like a certificate to prove that I don't have tuberculosis. Zimbabwe featured on a list this time. It wasn't a list you wanted to be featured on because it was like a list of countries that need to provide this certificate to prove that you don't have tuberculosis. And I had to go to the IOM and as you can imagine, this test is also really expensive. I remember like when I got the certificate, the guy was like telling me, don't bend the certificate, keep it very straight, keep it in this envelope. You could be asked for it. I don't recall being asked for it. Maybe my memory is failing me. The odd thing that people don't really know about visas is that you actually don't know if you've got the visa until you actually open up your passport. So I received the message from like the courier service um, because our visas aren't actually processed in Zimbabwe. They're sent to Pretoria and back. And so you have to pay for that fee as well. I think it goes with like FedEx and you know, FedEx charges are like through the roof. So I got the alert, come and pick up your passport. And I was just holding my breath because I was like, I don't know, this was the final step and I just don't know. 
and um, opened my passport. There it was, my British visa, and it was just the most exciting thing. And I think I'll always remember my mom's, um, just the sigh of relief when I opened my passport and you know the visa presented itself. And I was surely on my way to the UK. Leading me to the final part of this video, part seven, happiness hit her like a train on a track. So my first few days in the UK were lovely. I was not in London, I was with my family in Surrey. And I just remember going into London for my induction day, which was just so special. And my aunt came with me and it was just, there's actually a picture where you can literally see that I'm just like internally exploding with emotions because it's so surreal to have just gone through all these barriers to finally get there and see like the UCL dome or like as we colloquially called it portico in the flesh like guys like it is surreal and one day when I can fully articulate that feeling I will have it in a book but that day is not today right now all I can tell you is that I was just like the happiest person in the world and then of course I met my personal tutor and let me tell you guys God has a sense of humor for sure because my personal tutor was in fact Italian I promise you, like my friends and I had such a good laugh about it. And I remember my first ever meeting with him, like my first one-on-one -on -one with him. The first thing he asked me was, Venice, what do you think about Venice? And I was like, it's not for me, love. And he was like, I don't like Venice either. And thus our alliance was formed. Nothing bonds two people together like hating the same city. Of course, you know, I was really happy, but you know, it wasn't the end of my issues. In fact, a few weeks into my exchange where I was so happy and, you know, just living la vida loca, my university actually reached out to me because I had an outstanding document and they threatened to cancel my Erasmus. And I was just like, okay, now how did your life change? Did you, did you get the guy? Did you get the job? Is your house any bigger? Did, did money just magically, you know, get put in your pocket? What positive happened in your life after you just tore that woman down? My Erasmus coordinator, even though he was very lovely, I cannot give him any points for competence because honestly, I remember time was of the essence and I needed this document and it took him three attempts to just literally put a signature on this PDF. The first time he sent it back and the second page of the PDF was completely distorted. And then the second time, I want to tell you I'm making this up. Um, he had put his name in the signature field and vice versa. And I was just like, the feminine urge to forge this signature right now. For legal purposes, that is very much a joke. And I do need to mention, I'm just somebody who is like so full of gratitude because I'm always aware that things could be so much worse. And my first few weeks of being in the UK, again, I'll say like I'm culturally British, so there wasn't much of a culture shock, but I definitely took some time to adjust to just being treated like a, like a human being again. You know, I remember this one time because of course my Italian bank account was just full of madness and um, it wasn't allowing me to access my online banking. And of course I tried to communicate with them and in true Italian fashion, they just told me, well, get on, a, get on a plane and come back to Italy so we can sort this out. Eventually, I actually had to do this thing where the way I got my, my financial aid money was I would literally have to go to the bank every day and withdraw money. So I'd have to like withdraw like 400 pounds every day until I reached my figure for rent because we'd actually pay our rent um, per term. So yes, when Cardi B wrote, I be in and out them bank so much, I know they're tired of me. Yes, she was writing it from a different perspective, but it was still highly applicable to me. Anyway, I remember the one day I had not calculated correctly, so I would fall like a day short. So I literally went to the reception and I can't tell you guys how stressed I was. I didn't want to, you know, have an exception made for me. And I remember I just went to the reception and I just explained my situation and I was really like frantic and, you know, kind of stressed. And I remember not me getting emotional telling this story, but I remember the lady just kind of like stopped me in my tracks and she was like, it's okay, it's, it's gonna be okay. It's not like we don't know where the money is, we know where it is, it's in Italy, it's coming. Um, one day is really not gonna harm anybody, that's all good. Um, yeah, we'll receive your rent tomorrow. You guys, when I tell you I went back to my room and I just, I just cried because I was just like, she took my word for it. She didn't overcomplicate things. She made an exception because she understood my story. And 
she just believed me. Like, it's a cliche, but when you go places where you're celebrated and not tolerated, like you just really start to thrive. And I remember having dinner with Eve the one night and she was just like, Lami, you're so happy. And I was like, I should probably introduce myself to you. Like, this is me. This is, you know, this is me when I'm not in flight or fight mode all the time. Um, if you allow me to talk about this, I will go for my romantic tangents about how much I loved my time in London. But I will answer some questions which I think you might have. The first question being, do you have a degree from UCL? The answer is no, I do not have a degree from UCL, but I promise you, there were moments where I felt very deserving of one, especially because um, the pandemic happened to um, come in the midst of that academic year. And so, you know, when exceptions were being made about essays and stuff for all of the students, Erasmus kids, like we were very much told, no, it doesn't include you. Because UCL, you know, I, I kind of understand where they were coming from. They were like, we want no smoke with your universities. You will do every single one of the essays, like no exceptions will be made for you. So yeah, we really did work really hard. Also, I've never been asked if I actually have a UCL degree, not even by the UN. I think it's just as important that I spent a whole academic year there. How did you fare academically? So interestingly enough, um, I remember my first ever like meeting with the other Erasmus kids. There was this lady who um, I think, I don't even remember what her official title was, but she was like the administrative person, like the go-to administrative person for history. And it was one of those moments where I was like, did she really just, did? because she was basically like, She's like, don't really expect to get any two ones because those are very hard to get. You probably won't perform as well as the UCL kids. And then, as if that wasn't enough, she turns to me, looks directly at me and goes, even if English is your native language. When I tell you I was shocked, me and the French girls, shook. Apart from that, you guys, obviously I, you know, switching to a whole new study discipline, obviously it came with its challenges. I speak about some of them on my podcast, actually. Um, but you know what, if you really want something, you put in the work and make it happen. And you know, it was quite interesting because I think I am negatively motivated to a certain extent, but it's definitely not sustainable for me. So, you know, maybe it's enough to like prove somebody wrong to get me started, but that's not what's going to sustain my motivation. But I did have a last laugh kind of moment because at the end of the year, my certificate, which did have a couple two ones on there, might I just add, had to actually go through this lady to be signed. Never believe a statistic that doesn't empower you. And lastly, because my battery is really frustrated at this point, um, was it worth it? Despite the pandemic stealing half of my Erasmus, I would 1 million percent say it was worth it. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I've had so much fun finally telling this long overdue story. I hope to see you soon.